Well, let's dissect it now and the politics behind it with Robert Tyler from the Foundation for European Reform. Uh, welcome to the programme. First of all, uh, the European Parliament making a move here, led um, as it was being cheerled on there by Giva Hofstadt of Renew Europe, the sort of Eurofederalists within the European Parliament. Is this a bit of showboating or does it, does it actually have some importance? Well, as you mentioned rightly, it's a non-binding resolution that the European Parliament passed yesterday in Strasbourg. Um, however, what's important about it is the uh, level of support that the amendment um, ultimately received. Um, as you could see from the almost majority of uh, all MEPs from across the political spectrum voted for the amendment that was, although cheer-led by uh, Guy Verhofstadt, initially tabled by Conservative MEPs, mostly from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, now, whilst it's a symbolic gesture, it's also incredibly important because what it has shown us is that the members of the European Parliament uh, from, I would say, political parties that are in government in a lot of member states where the national government perhaps doesn't support a total energy ban in the same way. And obviously what's important there is that sanctions are the uh, competency of the European Council. So what we're seeing is that... Uh, MEPs from France and from Germany, where the governments are opposed to energy sanctions, have voted for the amendment, but the governments at the European Council level have remained quite, uh, shall we say, sceptical of um, introducing a total ban, whereas they favoured in the past a, a phased out ban of hydrocarbons. I suppose this is a fascinating exploration of the different levels of European democracy. Of course, one of the criticisms of Brexiteers for so many years was that European MEPs are not particularly close to the people they purport to represent. Uh, no one really could name their MEP in any UK uh, European election. And, and so to some extent, could this be people being insulated from the consequences? Because let's put in no doubt, uh, stopping all imports of any Russian gas at all would be pretty economically tough for the peoples of Europe. Might the council, therefore, the heads of government of those European countries, be more responsive to democratic concerns and potentially economic ones? Uh, I think that's, it, it's possible to argue that. But what's interesting is that the council is split. So what you find is that you have an almost direct east-west divide uh, within the European Union, where you find that countries like Germany, Austria, France are much more reluctant to put a total ban on hydrocarbons from, from Russia. Countries closer to Russia's border, say, for example, Poland and the Baltic states, have already introduced unilateral bans on imports. Um, and it, it is, in a way, a response perhaps to the geography of the situation. Those countries are closer to Russia, so they feel the threat much more. For example, we've already seen that Poland has taken nearly 3 million refugees from Ukraine. I imagine that the stories that those people are telling when they arrive in Poland have much more of an impact than the economic consequences of such, a, of such sanctions. Um, I, I also see that, um, you know, with these energy imports and the divide, that... The uh, countries like France and Germany uh, are further away from Russia. They don't see the consequences. And for the longest time, this has been the divide in, in Brussels. Uh, you, you, you know, a few years ago, if you had attended committee meetings or attended conferences, you would have heard MEPs or politicians from Central and Eastern Europe taking a much tougher line on Russia than those from France and Germany who have, you know, they, they don't live with the day-to-day -day consequences of all of this. I think one final thing that's interesting about this, of course, is the countries that were quicker to respond were the ones where the leaders had already been to Kiev. So we know that Ursula von der Leyen is visiting Kiev today. But a few weeks ago, we had the Polish, Czech and uh, Slovenian prime ministers visiting Kiev and perhaps got a more direct message. Uh, and, you know, Zelensky yesterday posted on his Instagram feed a very impactful video where he effectively said, when you buy Russian oil, you're not paying in euros or rubles, you're paying with Ukrainian lives. And I think that's the message you get much more from Eastern Europeans than you do from the West. Really fascinating situation. We'll see what the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has to say about it later today when he speaks in Downing Street. But for now, Robert Tyler from the Foundation for European Reform. Thanks for talking us through those issues.